And uh, joining us today on our Book Talk segment, great to welcome a man who's written a very interesting, fascinating book uh, about the Vietnam War. It's called American Reckoning, the Vietnam War and Our National Identity. We're joined today by uh, Christian App. He's a professor of uh, history at the University of Massachusetts, and he joined us by telephone. And uh, uh, Christian, good to have you with us today. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me on. Are you digging out of the snow yet? <laughs> uh, no, I haven't even begun. It's two feet out there. But, but you're still basking in the glory of your patriots, so you, you can't complain too much. <laughs> of course, of course. <laughs> well, I had a chance to, to read through the book. I've always been fascinated by uh, by history, and uh, particularly uh, Vietnam War history. I, I was a, a, a young child when it was going on, but I do remember you know, watching the news about it. I guess this is probably the most examined uh, part of American history, perhaps, uh, in the 200-plus years we've been around, right? Yeah, it's true, judging by the... 30,000 plus books that have been written on the subject and the, you, you, you might imagine that we had completely exhausted it but uh, actually one of the things that fascinates me is that for all of that there, we're now celebrating the 50th anniversary of some of these major decisions uh, I'm amazed by how much actually we have uh, forgotten despite all those those books and that's really what kind of motivated, motivated me to go back into it and try to recover some of this history in large part for my students who you know, that's sort of ancient history for the 180 students I have every year that take my class on the Vietnam War. Do, do you find uh, college kids of, of today, or even maybe the last 10 years, uh, are as interested in it as, as people that obviously weren't alive when, when yeah, it ended? Right. Oddly, oddly enough, they are deeply curious about it, even though they don't bring to the class many settled convictions or much knowledge about it. I mean, other than the, their sense that, yes, the 60s was a time of turmoil and this was a controversial war. Um, I, I think many of them uh, had sort of the sense it was like a dark family secret that uh, no one was sort of supposed to talk about around the children and that maybe in this class somehow it will finally get exposed. So it makes them actually very uh, interesting and, and uh, uh, open to open to education. They can they can really be surprised, you know, to learn new things. I guess one of the, the, the best things as far as uh, teaching about or historically uh, uh, it was the first war, if you want to say, uh, on television, right? I mean, uh, the K Korean War was right be the infancy of television. There wasn't a lot on it, but, but television every night covered that war, Vietnam. Yeah, and, and that's part of the explanation for why it was such, um, um, really, a, a shattering experience and such a contrast to the 20 years after World War II, where coming out of that great victory was really the heyday of American exceptionalism, a time when most um, Americans had a pretty deep faith in the idea that we were the good guy, always the good guys, always uh, on the side of freedom and democracy, and, and also huge trust that the government um, would do the right thing and would um, advance those ideals. Uh, all of that really came into fundamental question during the 1960s as a growing number of Americans began to, to realize that the, the government they had so trusted actually had in many ways misled them and even lied about origins of the war and how it was being conducted and, and our, uh, their own sense of what the um, possibilities were for, for success in that war. And two, one of the things that yeah, oh, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, uh, no, World, just, World War II. Yeah. We know the start of that, at least the impetus of it. Obviously, Hitler, and then you know Japan at Pearl Harbor, Vietnam. Uh, really, so many little things kind of started to to get that going, but nobody really knows the exact first uh, beginning right. of the Vietnam War. There is, exactly. I mean, do you mark it from '61 uh, when Kennedy begins to escalate the Gulf of Tonkin incident, the uh, um, Johnson's decision to bomb North Vietnam, or do you go all the way back to with uh, '54 when the United States, after the French lost the, the possession of their colony, and we moved in to try to build this permanent country called South Vietnam, which I do think is decisive and one of the things that. Americans started to realize in the 60s is that back in the back in the mid 50s there the Geneva Accords had called for a nationwide election in Vietnam Vietnam was never intended to be two separate countries only a temporary division and that and uh, there would be an election that would reunite the country and the the United States actually blocked those elections because Eisenhower had intelligence that if they were to go forward the communist leader Ho Chi Minh was likely, almost certain, to win something like 80% of the vote in, 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 the, in the South as well as the North. So 
that that um, that was one of a number of kinds of revelations that 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 helped explain the development of the biggest anti-war movement uh, in our history, and got to the point by 1971 when more than 70 percent of Americans had concluded that the war was a mistake, and even more um, more significantly, uh, more than 58 percent, or more than 50 percent, about 58 percent of Americans concluded that the war was immoral. So there really was a, a challenge, uh, uh, unprecedented challenge to the sense of ourselves as, as forever, uh, you know, morally superior to the rest of the world in a sense that uh, that we had uh, we had done wrong in Vietnam, just not more than a mistake. Yeah, no, no clear cut enemy again. World War Two, we knew who our enemies were at the time, right? Nazis yeah, and, and no clear cut threat to national right. security, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Um, and even as I say, this is one of the more appalling things I try to reveal in, in American Reckoning. This book is the way in which Johnson and other politicians, internally, and not in public, but in their private things, you know, private conversations, they were they really were very pessimistic that we could do more than just uh, delay defeat or prevent it. I mean, we could certainly had the power to occupy South Vietnam indefinitely, but we, we the, the government we were propping up just did not have the broad support of its own people. Very similar, actually, to the Karzai government uh, in Afghanistan that we were supporting, or right. or the government in Iraq. And unless you have that turns out that military power just is not that effective. It really does come down to politics. If we, if the South Vietnamese really had supported that government that we'd supported, it, the outcome might have been very, very different. And, and you go back again, the, the, so many soldiers have talked about it and how handcuffed they were uh, fighting the Vietnam War. I, I guess people look back at World War II. We ended it with the atomic bomb. We probably could have done the same in Vietnam, but who knows what the collateral damage would have been with South Vietnam. But but it could have been done that way, but right. we fought handcuffed. Well, you know, Johnson, Johnson uh, was understandably very concerned about um, uh, that, that a more ruthless bombing campaign, at least in North Vietnam, might have brought the Chinese into the war as it had in uh, the Korean War. Um, so there was a little, rest you know, somewhat restrained war there, but the bombing campaign in South Vietnam was, which was much more in intensive. And we had a, very few people know this, or even even during the war, we dropped four times more bombs on South Vietnam, the country we claim to be defending from aggression, than we dropped on North Vietnam. Hmm. It makes it, it it makes it it gives them the dubious distinction of being the most bombed country in world history. Uh, more bombs than we dropped in all of World War II were dropped on uh, South Vietnam. So yeah, I say you know, we could we could have we could have fought with you know even more all out. Yeah, we could have used nuclear weapons, but then it doesn't solve the political question. Right. Obviously, uh, you could dominate dominate to dominate a country militarily is not the same thing to have mili um, political legitimacy. Or talk, meaning the support of the people. You talk a lot in the book and uh, that's, that's, of President yeah. Johnson too, and and this really did affect him not only politically but but uh, physically, right? I mean, it, it pretty much ended his life earlier than probably would have been, right? I mean, yeah, he really yeah, he really he, agonized. Uh, it, it, took, it did, yes, and oddly enough, for a master politician who who you know uh, uh, really made a I think political miscalculation. Uh, he thought. That unless he um, stuck it out, and, you know, uh, in Vietnam, if he if he tried to pull out, he would be accused of being um, of surrendering, of being weak, of being a paper tiger, and that he would certainly be attacked not just by Republicans but from within his own party. Uh, and in fact, what hurt his political possibilities even more was the the fact that the war kept going on. Uh, without a clear result, and it led him actually to bow out. This most ambitious of all American politicians to bow out of the election in 1968, right. when he was uh, e even before it really had started to get engaged. Yeah, fascinating. Because uh, uh, he probably would have. Well, you would say probably would have won, although who knows? But I mean, he, he made I, that I announcement think, on honestly, TV. Uh, you can't, yeah, you can't, you can't tell. You can't relive history, but you know there was an interesting moment. There were these televised uh, hearings on the war by. Uh, uh, chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, William Fulbright, in 1966, and they they called as one of their witnesses one of the architects of the Cold War policy of containment, uh, George Kennan. And in the question, they they asked him, "Well, wh what if we did withdraw? What would the what would the political fallout be of that?" And and it was his, just his opinion, but he he said, "I think it would be about a six month sensation, but not more than that, and wouldn't have any lasting impact on politics either at home or abroad." Mm. 
so it was just his sense that you know Johnson might have recovered from that and gone on and then would you know of course his dream was to focus on domestic reforms and always agonized over uh, over the uh, over the war as a as a distraction from that that uh, highest of priorities for him. Yeah. Well, it's a fascinating look back. Uh, again, I remember some of it, and people out there that if they were alive, they're going to. Uh, be interested to, to read the history of it and be worn around. You're going to learn a lot. It's called American Reckoning. We've been talking with Christian Appy today. And uh, Christian, you have a website you want to direct people to? Sure. It's just ChristianAppy.com. And they can uh, also get the book. We'll post it up on our website as well. But uh, Christian, appreciate you taking a few minutes. Good luck with the book, and hopefully we can talk to you again sometime. Great. Thanks for having me. If you'd like to order the book we're talking about, please go to DougMilesMedia.com and enter the author's name in the Amazon search box. Thank you for listening. Please come back soon for more conversations here at DougMilesMedia.com. This has been a presentation of Doug Miles Media, all rights reserved. You can listen to or download previous programs at iTunes, Stitcher.com, or Doug Miles Media.